So tonight we're going to cover a very important topic, but let me begin by asking you, have you ever seen a person with a sign saying, the end is near? Yeah? <laughs> now, have you ever talked to such a person? No? <laughs> Why not? I mean, it, do you believe that the end is near? Yes. Why is it that you have not felt like talking to a person saying the end is near? Is it because perhaps what they have to say is not something good? Perhaps it's not good news? And see, friends, when we began our journey together in this book of Revelation, I told you that the book of Revelation is not supposed to be a scary book. There's scary symbols, but it's not supposed to make you afraid. It is a message of hope. So we're going to get to the most hopeful part of the book of Revelation. And I want to start with something scary. Isaiah 13, 6 says, Wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners in it, from it. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. The prophet Joel says, For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? What do you think about this image? In fact, that image is called the day of the wrath. The day of the Lord, the day of the, the Lord's wrath is called, I think, officially. <clears throat> now, this is the image that we normally think of when we think of Revelation. We think of the destruction of the earth when God comes to judge the earth. When I was thinking of this image, I thought of a song, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to hear it. We have the microphone there, and we're going to see if that works. But you'll recognize it right away, I believe. Oh, what's happening? Okay, enough of that. <laughs> what is that? What is the song? It's called Dies Irae. And do you know what it's from? I think some of you know. It's Mozart, right? And it's from Mozart's Requiem. Now, this is actually the, the songs that they were singing, the, the lyrics that they're singing, the words come from a Latin, from a medieval Latin poem. And I'm going to tell you the part, the last part that you heard, because it is important for what we're talking, tonight, uh, talking about tonight. The second stanza of the series says, Quantos tremor es futurus, cuando iudes es venturus, cuncta stricte discusurus. Now, what does that mean? How much trembling there will be when the judge comes and strictly examines all things. The day of wrath. That's what this era means. The day of wrath. How much trembling there will be when the judge comes to examine all things. Let me ask you a question. Is this how you feel about the second coming of Jesus? Is this what you think of when you read Revelation? Is this the message of Revelation? You know, I love the Bible because... If you just read it long enough, <laughs> you get to see the whole picture. So let's go back to Isaiah for a moment. This is Isaiah 13. And the, verse, the first verse of that oracle tells you everything you needed to know before you got that picture. A prophecy against who? Against Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. 
Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Her time is at hand and her days will not be prolonged. So this prophecy, so scary, so terrible, who is it for? Is it for you? Well, what does the verse say? It's a prophecy against Babylon. And friends, what do we know about Babylon from Revelation? It's, well, let's just say this. We don't have to be in Babylon. The last message, God's final appeal was, come out of her, my people, so that you do not share in her plagues, so that this prophecy is not for you. Toward the ends of his, his life, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy. And he wrote what I believe is what we should think about when we read the book of Revelation. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. What day is that? The day of his coming, right? And not to me only, but also to, listen to this part, all who love his appearing. All who love his appearing. What is he referring to there? The second coming of Jesus. If you love his appearing, well, that says everything about you and your faith. Isaiah 25, 9 says, In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Friends, we want to study tonight the events that lead up to the, well, the events that lead up, follow, that follow the second coming of Jesus. Because we want to know what awaits for us. We don't want the day of wrath. We want to know what Jesus is going to do when he comes for us. That is the hope that we have. So we're going to go to the book of Revelation. And we're going to start for our first question. Question number one says, what glorious scene did John see happening in heaven? <clears throat> Revelation 19. We're going to be in Revelation 19 for a while. Verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Now, the next question is going to ask, who is the writer? But you already know because of the title that he's given here. He is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. I don't know if you already got that. Re Re Revelation 19, 11. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. So question number two says, who is this person riding on the white horse? Well, verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Why is Jesus called the Word of God? Now, we know from John chapter 1, we're going to read that next. One of the reasons Jesus is called the Word of God, but in fact, I think there's at least two reasons relevant to us in the book of Revelation that we need to know why Jesus is called the Word of God. So let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So, what is the saying about Jesus Christ? What is the saying about the Word of God? That all things were created 
through him. So Jesus is, in fact, the creator. Now, don't get confused here, because the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. And, and what is, was it God or is it Jesus? Well, Jesus is God. <laughs> we were just told that he was in the beginning with God and that he was God. God the Father created all things through his word, and his word is Jesus Christ. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, God is spirit, Jesus says. What is the breath of God's mouth? Does God breathe? Does he breathe air? This is where we get into trouble, right? We're trying to figure out what that means. So we have to accept that God is not like us. When he says that God spoke, it's not sounds, it's not air moving through the air, but it's a different way that he speaks. Jesus is the word of God. What does that mean? Colossians 1.16 says, for, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus is the word of God in action. Now, when we speak, we move the particles in the air. But when God speaks, that's something else. What God wills, Jesus accomplishes. Now, there's one more reason that Jesus is called the word of God. And that is found also in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us or tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, I believe it was Philip that asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and then we will believe. And Jesus says, I have been with you this whole time. Don't you know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. That's why in Colossians, in the same chapter we read, it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the revelation of God. If we want to know what God is like, behold the Son. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's will and God's love. So we can know God because we have Jesus to behold. Question three says, who accompanies Christ when he returns for this battle? Okay, back to Revelation 19. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So Jesus, in his first coming, he came as a man, as a simple man. He did not come with his angels, with honor and glory. But Jesus told his disciples that his second coming would be very, very different. In Matthew 25, 31, Jesus said that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Jesus is coming with all the hosts of heaven. You know, do you recall the story when King Hezekiah is afraid because Sennacherib is coming to conquer Jerusalem? Actually, he had already conquered about 40 towns. And he goes and pleads to God, with God and says, what can we do, Lord? Please save us. In fact, uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sends a very offensive letter to the people of Jerusalem. And that night, the story says, that night, the angel of the Lord, one angel of the Lord, struck down 185 Assyrians. 185,000, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, that would be a small number. So one angel slaughtered 185,000 men. How many angels are in heaven? <laughs> we don't know, but it's millions upon millions upon millions, right? A, a large, large number. And Jesus is coming with all the hosts of heaven. Now, we have a lot of people on earth. 
But I guarantee you, <laughs> Jesus has the upper hand here. The enemies of God don't stand a chance. Matthew 24, 30 says, And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Who are the Lord's elect? His saints. Are you in that number? <laughs> I didn't hear an amen. <laughs> so the angels are going to go and gather the elect. Actually, they're not even coming to fight, right? They're coming to take us home. God himself will fight for us. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, then, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. Question four says, what title does Christ have at this time? Okay, at Revelation 19, verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, which is what? King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, have you thought about this before? Because I have. <laughs> we have a lot of kings on this earth. We have a lot of rulers. Would you say that most rulers, most people that rule, whether they're presidents, kings, whatever they are, would you say that they would recognize Jesus as their king? I mean, some of them don't even know who Jesus is. And those that do, yeah, I'm not sure that they really know him. So why is it that Jesus is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Actually, we have already studied this before. Jesus, in fact, is coming to overthrow all kingdoms. All nations will be overthrown by Jesus. Revelation 5.10 says, And you, Christ, have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. So the reason Jesus is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is not because of the kings that currently rule, but because you, the saints, will be made the rulers of this earth. Isn't that what Jesus says about the good and faithful servant? That he would make him a ruler over many things? That's why he is the king of kings. Who is the army that fights against Christ and the army of heaven? Revelation 19, 19 says, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies, gathered together to make war against him, who sat on the horse and against his, against his army. So the world's armies are arrayed in battle against Christ, against his church, against his angels. Now we've already talked about the battle of Armageddon, and we know that this is not a physical battle, but it is a battle nonetheless. Who is it that gathers all the people together for this battle? Again, this we're reviewing here. Revelation 16, 12 says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and his water was dried up. I was trying to think if we had discussed this before, but in case we didn't, um, what do you know about the river Euphrates? It's a big river, and where is it? In fact, there's a place called Mesopotamia that has two rivers. That's what the limit between the rivers is called Mesopotamia. Euphrates is one of them. The other one's the Tigris. The river Euphrates run right down the middle of a city. You can probably guess which city that was. Babylon. Now, in 539, a king from the east, the king of the Persians and the Medes, he conquered Babylon. Do you know, perhaps you've read, do you know how he conquered Babylon? It's actually quite a famous story. He diverted the river. So in essence, he dried up the river, right, the riverbed, so that his army was able to go under the gates, under the walls, following the riverbed. And he managed to sneak into the city at night and conquer the city that way. So when the Bible says in Revelation that the Euphrates will be dried up, so that the, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared 
what do you think that is pointing us to? The destruction of Babylon is imminent. The king from the east was Cyrus, the Messiah. By the way, Cyrus called the Messiah. Did you know that? He's called, he's called the anointed of the Lord because by destroying Babylon, he was able to free the people of Israel, the Israelites, the, the Jews, eventually. So the drying up of the Euphrates in Revelation 16 is a foreshadowing of the imminent destruction of Babylon by God and his armies. Verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits of life rocks coming out of the mouth of the beast and of the mouth of the false prophet. We talked about this yesterday. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle, to the battle of the, that great day of God Almighty. So, I believe yesterday we talked about how these spirits of demons were the miracles being performed in order to establish the propaganda and the lies that are coming out of the false prophet and the beast. So, the religious leaders of the earth, the priests, the pastors, the rabbis, the imams, they will all repeat and endorse the lies that are coming out uh, from the beast and the false prophet. And then these lies will be reinforced through miraculous signs that are performed by these apostate Protestant churches. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Okay, and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Now, we already talked about Armageddon, but what did you remember about Armageddon? Is Armageddon going to take place in Israel? Is there going to be a battle in Israel where Russia and Iran and, I don't know, China or something, are they going to meet there? What kind of battle is the battle of Armageddon? It's a, it's a, spirit, it's a worldwide a spiritual conflict between God and Satan and the beast, the false prophet. Okay, number seven says, what is the final plague that falls on this assembled army? Revelation 16, 17 says, And the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. You recall that I believe this is Jesus saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings, and, the, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. So, the seventh plague was what? An earthquake that is going to do something. Now, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Now, what was the great city? The great city in Revelation is what? Babylon, right? Babylon is the only one called the great city. And why three parts? Well, we mentioned this briefly. Satan's kingdom is controlled by three powers. There's, of course, Satan, the dragon, and then the beast and the false prophet. Those are the three parts of Babylon. Now, we, say, we said that like in the days of the Tower of Babel, all the nations of the earth will come together in one purpose. And what is it going to, they're going to try to do at that moment? What are they being gathered together for? Now, God is in heaven, right? This is not, he's not on earth yet. What are they trying to do? They're trying to destroy God's remnant. Right? They're looking for the remnant to destroy. They cannot reach God, so they hate and fear the saints of the Most High. And just when it seems like they are going to be able to destroy God's elect, seventh plague, earthquake happens, and then the great city is divided into three parts. Now, I believe that means that they're going to cease working together. God is going to do something that's going to destroy their unity. All of a sudden, that one purpose and one mind, if you recall when God came and visited Babel, what happened? He confused them, right? They left. They were scattered. Something will happen that will destroy the unity of this unholy trinity. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup 
of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Now, I think we've had hail here recently. I'm trying to remember the last time we had hail. Um, how much do you think a talent weighs? 75 pounds? Depending on what time period, 75 to 100 pounds. Now, if, imagine if you had 100 pound hailstones. What kind of damage would that cause? We will be talking about that for years, right? That would be a great disaster upon the earth. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Now, if you actually go and look at hailstone, how God uses hailstones in, in the Old Testament, you're going to find all kinds of stories. Mostly, God uses this kind of plague as judgment. Now, you probably remember the plague of uh, hail in Egypt. But in the book of Job, there's something very interesting. If you go to Job 38, it says here, Have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of travel, for the day of battle and war? There's a story in Joshua, I believe it's uh, Joshua chapter 10, where they're fighting against these Amorites, the Amorite kings, and the people of Israel, they win the battle, but then the enemies are routed. And they cannot catch up. There's just too many of them. They're running away. So then God sends hailstones. And the story says that more people die from the hail than from the Israelites. So in other words, God kind of finished them off. And I believe this is a reference to what God is going to do at that time in the seventh plague. What tremendous event is ushered in by this great earthquake? Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and set to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You know, the first thing that happens to Adam and Eve after they sin, well, the first thing that happens is they realize they're naked. And then when God comes, what do they do? They hide. And why do they hide? Do they hide because God is so scary? No. They were ashamed. They were afraid. You know, this has nothing to do with the character of God. It has everything to do with the character of the men and women and Satan, the angels, that are going to stand before the Lord on that day. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now this question is asked in the book of Revelation. It's asked in the Old Testament by the prophets. It's a, quest a question that comes up again and again. Who is able to stand on the great day of the Lord's wrath? Now from what we have studied so far in Revelation, if you have to give an answer, what would you say? Who is able to stand? the day of the Lord's wrath. His saints, and his saints are known, where they're known because they keep the commandments of God, they have the faith of Jesus, but so far, recently, we have studied that God has called out his people out of Babylon. So, if you are in Babylon, you will not be able to stand. And you will not be able to stand because you will be receiving the plagues. Only those who have chosen to follow Jesus out of Babylon will be able to stand on that day. If you follow Jesus out of Babylon, you will say, This is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us. Amen. 
How many people will see Jesus when he returns to earth? Ah. Revelation 1 7 Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And how many eyes will see him? Every eye. Now, this is interesting, right? Because, of course, some people are blind. <laughs> so we're not sure how that will work, but maybe they will receive vision so that they can see Jesus coming in the clouds, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Now, we've read this already before, and this was done in Revelation. If we go back to Matthew 24, it says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Huh. And they will see the Son of Man co coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So every eye shall see his coming. Why do you suppose Jesus chose to come this way? Why every eye? The coming of Jesus is going to be a worldwide cataclysmic event. You won't have to read about it in the news. You won't have to take out your phone. You'll know immediately that Jesus has come. I believe there's a good reason for that. How visible will this event be? Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, have you ever stood right in front of lightning? If you close your eyes, you know what? You can still see lightning. I believe that's why it says it will be like lightning, because you won't be able to avoid it. The wicked are going to wish not to see his coming, but they won't be able to help it. Why? What does Christ bring with him at that time? Revelation 22, 12 says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Now, I'm glad that we have the testimony of Scripture because Jesus says exactly this to his disciples. And Matthew, Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Okay, how will Christ's return affect the righteous, living and dead? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, for the, day, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So, when Jesus comes back, his second coming, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, what happens to the dead that are not in Christ? <laughs> That's coming up in another presentation. <laughs> well, Jesus actually talks about it. There's going to be another resurrection, right? There's going to be another resurrection for them, but it will not be at that time. So you want to be part of the first resurrection. In fact, that's what Jesus says. You want to be part of the first resurrection when Jesus comes back the second time. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus is going to collect all his saints, dead and alive, the righteous, in one moment, in the day of his second coming. They shall be caught up together. By the way, I think the word rapture, well, it's not here, this is not the word rapture, but this is where the idea of the rapture comes. Now, there will be a rapture, but it will be at the second coming. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. What knowledge of the events taking place will the dead have just prior to Christ's second coming? We studied this yesterday. Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know what? Nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their memory is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy 
have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. You know, what is it, one of the reasons that people say, go stick around? <laughs> they have unfinished business, right? They have things to do. Well, Ecclesiastes says, they have no love, no hatred, no envy, nothing. They have no reason to stick around because they know nothing. The dead are dead. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit, his spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Where does the spirit go? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, we read this yesterday. The spirit returns to God who gave it. So, in fact, it is the Spirit of God that gave um, the ability of, gave us the ability to live. Okay, outline the events that happened at death and after death to the righteous. So we're going to try to do this together. Job 14.12 says, So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not wait awake, nor be roused from their sleep. So, the dead are asleep, waiting for the second coming. Nothing will arouse them, nothing will awake them. They are waiting until Christ comes back. Verse 13 says, And that you would hide me in the grave. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave. That you would conceal me until your wrath is past. So, if you wanted to find somebody that's dead, the only place that you can look for them is in the grave. Because there's no one else to be, they're nowhere else to be found. They're not accessible to the living. That you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Okay, verse 14. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. What is the change, by the way? I think we read a verse yesterday. What is the change that we are waiting for? We want a new body, right? We want to be resurrected into an incorruptible body. We're waiting for the incorruptible, the immortality that we will be clothed with. Verse 15 says, You shall call, and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hand. hands. Okay, you shall call, and I will answer you. Verse 15. The coming of Christ and the resurrection of the dead is not a new teaching. This all came from the book of Job, which is the oldest book in the Bible. So it is clearly what the Bible teaches from the beginning. The dead are dead and they're waiting for the day of resurrection, the day of Christ's coming. What does the Bible call the death of those who await the Lord's return? We learned this yesterday. Also, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as those, as others who have no hope. So the ones that have fallen asleep, that have died in the Lord, are, have fallen asleep. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You know, Christ could have used any kind of metaphor in the Bible for dead. And I'm glad he used sleep because when you go to sleep, you wake up. That's a fact, right? If you're sleeping, you wake up. And sooner or later, you're going to wake up. So the promise to those who await in the Lord is that they will wake up once again. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Amen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. Um, there's a lot of slides, so I apologize I'm going fast. Uh, we're going to have to hurry it up a little bit. And when the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there it is again. The trumpet of God will wake up all the dead in Christ. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to beat the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, John 11, 11 says, This thing he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. By the way, if you want to really understand what the disciples thought about that, 
read John 11. That whole story really tells you everything you need to know about that. Then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Okay, we said this yesterday. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So the dead know nothing. The dead don't make plans. The dead don't, don't praise the Lord. The dead have no part in anything under the sun. The Bible teaching on death is very clear. The dead have died and they're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Okay, what will the return of Christ bring to the righteous? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all be, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is the promise. We shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will raise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, this promise is for those that are alive or dead? For all, right? Everybody. If you died and you had lost your ability to walk, you lost an eye, you lost an arm, when, God, when Christ comes back, you will be changed into incorruptible. You will be made perfect. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall we be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, Philippians 3, 20 to 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. By the way, what does this have to do with Jesus? Why do we need to be transformed according to this verse? We've been following Jesus on earth, right? We want to be like Jesus. We want Jesus in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. When we get to heaven, this verse is saying, we need to be transformed, that we may be conformed to the way Jesus is. It is because Jesus has been perfected, because Jesus has a perfect body, we are going to be like him in every way. We will have a glorious and incorruptible body, because Jesus has that kind of body in heaven. There will be no pain, no suffering, no aches, no more cancer, only youthful energy and vigor. Now, I don't know what that feels like. Unfortunately, I don't know if you do. <laughs> I don't recall it. Maybe there was a point in my life when I was that way. But certainly, I think we all need more energy. And forever, when we're in heaven with Jesus, we will have that kind of energy. We will have vigor. We will have no pain, no sickness, no weakness. What happens to the wicked who are alive at Christ's second coming? Okay, this is the scary part. Revelation 18.15 says, Now out of his mouth, goes a sharp sword, and with that with it, he should strike the nations. So out of his mouth, out of, out of whose mouth? Jesus. Out of the mouth of Jesus, there's a sharp sword. With it, he should strike the nations. This is happening at his coming, right? This is after the, the seventh plague. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself threads the winepress of the fierceness of, and wrath of Almighty God. And the rest were killed with the sword. The rest of what? The rest of the people on earth, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Now, if you go to 2 Thessalonians, I don't have it here because of time, but 2 Thessalonians 2a says that Christ will destroy the end time apostate religious system, actually the Antichrist, with the breath of his mouth and destroy them with the brightness of his coming. So Paul also mentions that it is through his mouth that he will destroy the wicked. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now, 
so far there's a metaphor of battle in this story, right? In Revelation 19, we've been following this metaphor, the great battle of the Lord. This is why this birds eating the flesh of the wicked comes up here. The image of the birds of the field of the air and the beasts of the field eating the dead of the wicked, this goes back to the Old Testament. Now, when the history of this planet closes, there's a funny mention here. We haven't read that verse here in Revelation. I think it's Revelation 19, 17. It says that there's going to be another kind of supper, <laughs> right? Those of us that follow the Lamb, we will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But those that stay in, Mab in Babylon will be at the supper of the birds. God will call the birds, metaphorically, the birds of the earth, to feast on the corpses of the wicked. Friends, today is the day to get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Choose you yourselves this day whom you will serve. Surrender all at the feet of Jesus. That is the only way that we can be ready for his coming, to receive his robe of righteousness. Okay, verse, uh, question 18. What happens to the beast power and the false prophet at this time? Revelation 19, 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence. Now, we're not told exactly what will cause the capture, or how it will happen, but what we do know that this is the end of the reign. Do you recall who the beast was supposed to be in Revelation? The, the, the papal power, right? The papal power, apostate Christianity, well, the false prophet is apostate Protestantism and the beast is the papacy. So together they form they form the apostate Christianity. So the beast is captured and with him the false prophet. And what does the false prophet do for the beast? What does it say here? Who works signs in his presence by which he deceived those who receive the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. Again, the weapon of Satan in this great battle is deception, lies, and miracles. There, those two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So the fate of the false prophet and the beast is that they're going to be cast alive in the lake of fire. We're going to study the lake of fire this Friday. Uh, Pastor Gordon is going to talk more about that. But if you've learned anything about Revelation, is that we should not be too literal in our interpretation of the lake of fire. Suffice it to say, the beast and the false prophet, which are the embodiment of apostate Christianity, will be completely destroyed at the lake of fire. Okay, what assurance do those who accept Christ have now? 1 John 5.11 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life, and this is life, and this life is his Son. So the testimony is that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Okay, friends, I want to end by answering, by trying to answer the question that the prophet Joel asked us at the beginning. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? When the people of Israel came out of Egypt and they came to the Mount, to Mount Sinai to confirm the covenant with the Lord, the Bible says that to the people of Israel, the glory of the Lord appeared like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. The people were terrified. They did not want to see God. So they went to Moses and they said to him, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. 
the people of God, the people of Israel, could not approach the mountain themselves. They needed an intercessor. Because of their sins, they could not approach God or they would be consumed in the presence of the Lord. Because Jesus died for our sins, we can have an intercessor. In fact, Hebrews says that Christ, who is our high priest, he lives to make intercession for us forever. Christ has bridged that gap, the chasm that separates us from God. He who has son has life. And it's not just because Christ is our intercessor. First John 5.21 uh, John 5.21 says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Now, when I share this with my Iranian friends in Turkey, it was a great revelation, because they always knew that Christ was supposed to be our lawyer, our advocate. But you know what? Christ is also our judge. The same man who gave up his life to save us. The same man that intercedes for us each day. The same, same man, the son of man, who promised to finish the good work that he has begun in each one of us. That man, that son of man, he is our judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So friends, on that terrible day of the Lord, who will be able to stand? We can stand because we have Jesus. Because we have the Son, we are not afraid of the coming of the Lord. In fact, we will rejoice. What is it that Isaiah says? In that day, they will say, in that day we will say, Surely this is our God, we trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. <clears throat> Friends, do you have the Son? Have you accepted Jesus? Are you willing to follow Jesus? Whatever he asks us to go. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done for us. And Lord, it is because of you that we are not afraid of the day of the Lord. In fact, Lord, we cannot wait for you to come back. We are ready to go home, Lord. And I pray for every person in this room, Lord, perhaps there are things in their lives that they need to change. Perhaps there are things in our lives, Lord, that we need to give up. But whatever it is, Lord, we trust that you will complete the good work that you have begun in us. Lord, we believe that you are mighty to save. And because you gave up everything for us, because you are our intercessor and our judge, our advocate before the Father, Lord, we claim the promise that if we surrender all to you, that you will make sure that we are more than conquerors in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.